evening. Today my message title is God's Righteous Judgment. Whose righteous judgment? God's. It's not easy to study this topic, but it's so important for us to have a right understanding of God. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your great love and mercy through Jesus through which we have received your grace. And thank you that you want us to know you as you are. Father, please reveal yourself to us. Help us to truly know you. Please guide me in sharing this message through your Holy Spirit. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. The key verse is Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Let's read this verse together, please. Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. <clears throat> In the last passage, chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, Paul indicted the fallen Gentile world that lived without God. They suppressed the truth by their godlessness and wickedness, and became idol worshipers, immoral, and depraved. Upon them, God's wrath was being revealed. When we hear this indictment, we may say, yes, that is right. Punish those evildoers. They deserve it. However, Paul makes a sudden shift in this passage. He no longer talks about they. Now it is you. Who? You. you. The personal pronoun you appears 15 times in verses 1 through 5. You are those who pass judgment on others based on their own moral standard. Now Paul turns his attention to the moralists, whether Jew or Gentile. Probably Paul's main target was the Jews, whose morally superior lifestyle set them apart from pagan Gentiles. And they freely condemned the Gentiles as animals. But Paul also addresses moralists among the Gentiles, such as the Stoics, including Cicero and Seneca. These Stoics recognized the natural order in the universe and tried to distinguish right and wrong. They had a high ethical standard and followed a moral lifestyle and were respected by their people. But they judged others based on their standard, and did not think they themselves were sinners. Paul indicts moralists, both Jew and Gentile, based on God's truth, and declares they are under God's judgment and without excuse. In some sense, it may be more difficult for moralists to accept the gospel because it is so hard to recognize that they are sinners. They are a little better than others in many ways and easily judge and condemn others. This was the problem of the Pharisees and the elder brother of the prodigal son. This can be our problem too. 
When we hear someone honestly confess all their sins, it's so easy to think, wow, what a terrible sinner that person is. Thank you, God, that I'm not like that person. Of course, we would not say this openly, but we think it in our hearts. Paul exposes this hypocrisy by telling us of God's righteous judgment. In this passage, the words judge or judgment appear nine times. And Paul describes God's judgment. It is inescapable. And it is righteous. And furthermore, he tells us that God's real intention is not judgment, but salvation that comes through repentance. Let's learn who God is and find ourselves before him. First, God's judgment is inescapable. What is God's judgment? While fallen Gentiles suppress the truth by their wickedness, moralists suppress the truth by passing judgment on others. Verse 1 says, You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on another. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Here the word you comes from a very special word that means mankind in general. And it refers to anyone who passes judgment on others. Such people think they're excused from God's judgment. But Paul says, you have no excuse. You do the same things. And you too will be judged by God. So here, what does he mean by judgment? When he says, pass judgment on others, he's not referring to public judgment, such as in a court of law. Public judgment is necessary. It promotes justice and order in society. And those who have authority for public judgment are God's servants to reward the righteous and punish wrongdoers. So we should not blame the policeman for judging us when he gives us a ticket. That's his job. But in these verses, past judgment indicates those who sit in judgment like God and condemn others. They do this without compassion or mercy or love. Why do people do this? They want to be right and others wrong. And then they feel superior to others. And it's even entertaining. Let me find all the ways I'm better than you. And it makes them feel good. Wow, I'm, I feel so much better. I felt terrible, but I saw you, you wretched person. I feel so much better now. And such people assume they're serving God. Wow, if I didn't point out all your faults, who would do that for you? And they pretend to be righteous before people. But in fact, they secretly do wicked things. They surf the internet when no one's looking and enjoy all kinds of pleasures in their minds and then suddenly appear at the meeting, oh, I'm holy and righteous. You're a terrible sinner. Jesus said, that kind of person has a plank in their own eye, but they're trying to take a speck of sawdust out of another's eye. It's so easy to detect faults in others and point them out and catalog them and find the reason for all my unhappiness in your sin problem. 
but it is so hard to find our own fault, even though it's much larger than others' faults. So we pass judgment. But ironically, when we pass judgment on others, we judge ourselves. Jesus said, do not judge or you too will be judged. We have no right to judge others. Judgment belongs to God alone. And judging others violates God's sovereignty. Verses 2 and 3 say, Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? In these verses, such things and the same things refer to the sinful acts mentioned in chapter 1. God will judge those who do such things based on truth. Truth is absolute, infinite, and universal, and one of the essential attributes of God. God is impartial. No one can violate his standard, whether Jew or Gentile, without being judged by God. However, self-righteous people think they can avoid God's judgment. I'm an exception. I'm a special person. Yeah, God and I, yeah, you know me, right? It's a false assumption. There's no special person before God. In verses 2 and 3, there is a contrast between human judgment and God's judgment. So human judgment is based on outward behavior and physical evidence. If a human court cannot find clear evidence, the suspect is released, even though he may be guilty. How many times have you seen a guilty person set free? Because there's no, not enough evidence, even though you know very well he did it. I'm not going to mention any names. This happens regularly. So people think, okay, there's a way to get out of judgment, of human judgment. Clever people always think they can beat the system. They're going to be the exception. But God's judgment is different. It is based on complete knowledge of all the facts. And God sees the heart of each person with eyes of blazing fire. No one can hide from his sight. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God sees everything, God knows everything, and there is no loophole in God's judgment. And it is inescapable. Paul deals with another false assumption about God's judgment in verse 4. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? What is the purpose of God's kindness? Repentance. What is the purpose of God's kindness? Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Why is this so important? 
You know, it's so easy for children to think their parents should sacrifice for them. And they say, yeah, mom, dad, that's your job. And in the same way, we assume God should be patient, kind, forgiving, loving, bearing. That's God's job. We think that because God is love, we are unconditionally accepted and free to live as we please and commit sins at random. And when God does not punish us immediately, we confirm this assumption. Oh, I sinned last night, but I'm still alive. I can sin more today. You know, God, with his mighty power and wisdom, could punish every sin immediately. He could terrify sinners and force us to change. But he doesn't do that. He wants us to repent willingly. This is why he is so patient and so kind. When we read Israel's history, we're amazed at the Lord's patience. For example, Manasseh was the most terrible king who ever lived in Judah. He worshiped idols more than anyone else and led Judah astray. He shed so much innocent blood and sacrificed his children in the fire to idols. He did so much evil in the eyes of the Lord. And this went on for 52 years. Bearing such a person is unthinkable. But the Lord bore with him. And then when Manasseh was in distress as a prisoner of the Assyrians, he humbled himself and prayed to God sincerely. And surprisingly, the Lord was moved by his plea and delivered him. Sometimes when we see people who commit terrible sins, we wonder why God does not judge them today. But we need to remember, God is patient. God is kind. Apostle Peter said this, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. We should always thank God for his patience. And we should repent of our sins and do our best to win people to Jesus before he comes again. So God is so patient and so kind. Please don't compete with Manasseh for God bearing you for 52 years. Repent today, soon. God is so patient and kind. But some people refuse to repent. And this shows contempt for God. Then what happens? Let's read verse 5 altogether, please. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Here, stubbornness is not a virtue. Stubbornness 
is a refusal to be corrected based on reason, facts, or truth. Refusal to be corrected. An insistence on one's own way without listening as an expression of pride. God does not judge immediately, but he does not overlook the stubbornness of unrepentant people. Actually, they're storing up wrath against themselves. It's kind of like using a credit card every day, racking up a charge, racking up a charge. The bill is growing. The bill is growing. But instead of money, it's wrath, an accumulation of wrath, punishment. When will this wrath be revealed? On the day of God's final judgment. This will happen when Jesus comes again. In the meantime, each of us face the day of our own death. Hebrews 9.27 says, Just as people are destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. We all have a destiny, an inescapable destiny, to die once and face judgment. Everyone dies. We don't know when, but we will all die. After death, after death, we cannot change our destiny. It's too late after death. And we will stand before God and give an account of what we have done and receive his judgment. God's judgment is inescapable for every human being. Second, God's judgment is righteous. Paul has mentioned that God's righteous judgment is revealed. In verses 6 through 10, he tells us why God's judgment is righteous. Here we can find God's criteria in judging sinners. Doesn't that sound interesting? Are you interested in this? Not so much, you'd rather just not talk about it. What is God's criteria? Look at verse 6. God will repay each person according to what they have done. Please notice here, God will judge people one by one, not family by family, tribe by tribe, fellowship by fellowship, or church by church. Uh, individual, individualistic Americans understand this, right? It applies to judgment too, you know. We're judged one by one. And no one can blame their parents. Just try blaming your parents before God. No one can blame the government or the system or their Bible teacher. A husband cannot rely on his wife's righteousness and vice versa. Children cannot rely on their parents' righteousness. But my dad was a missionary and vice versa. The verb do is repeated four times in verses 6 through 10. Do, right? It means actions, what we do. We're judged based on what we do, not what we say or think or wished that we had done, not our intentions, but what we do. Ultimately, these actions are the fruit of our inner life. Words can be deceptive, but fruit 
is unmistakable evidence. Nobody is going to lawyer their way out of God's judgment with lots of words. He'll see the deeds. If you don't believe it, he'll show you the video and then pronounce his judgment. The fruit of our lives is the basis of God's judgment. Social position, education, wealth, or family line are irrelevant. God's judgment is unbiased and fair to everyone. Secondly, God judges according to life purpose and motive. Let's read verses 7 and 8 together. Please. To those who buy... Do you have your Bible? you have your Bible? Please open your Bible if you have it. Let's read verses 7 and 8 together. Please. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. So here, Paul's emphasis is on what a person is seeking. What it is that they really desire in their hearts their life purpose and motive. Knowing one's motive is necessary in judgment. For example, if someone gives a lot of money to charity, but their motive is selfish, they fail God's judgment. The action was good, but the motive was wrong. Basically, there are two kinds of people those who seek glory, honor, and immortality, and those who are self-seeking. Self-seeking is serious sin. Why? It is exalting oneself to the place of God. And this is idolatry. Self-seeking people inevitably reject the truth and follow evil. No matter what they do, no matter how noble their actions may seem, whatever they do is sin because it doesn't come from a right heart motive. For all who follow evil, wrath and anger are inevitable. On the other hand, those who seek God's glory and true honor and immortality by persistence in doing good will receive eternal life. When we read verse 7, we may think that God will give eternal life on the basis of good deeds. But that's not true, and it's not what Paul is saying. In verses 7 to 11, the tenses of the verbs seek, reject, follow, does evil, does good, all indicate are doing and will continue to do so. It means doing good constantly, without fail, with a right motive to the very end of one's life. Is anyone on track to do this? Never made a mistake even one time? Actually, we cannot do this. It's impossible for fallen people to do this. In fact, our good deeds weigh a few ounces, but our evil deeds weigh tons. Isaiah said, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. This means that doing good is not a means of salvation, Doing good is the fruit of believing the gospel. Only those born again by the power of the Holy Spirit can do good continually and with a right motive. 
verses 9 and 10 are a general description of the consequences for those who do good and evil. God's judgment has consequences. He doesn't just give a grade and send us off to live as we please. There are consequences. Sometimes we envy worldly people, thinking that their life is carefree and fun all the time. Wow, they have their own reality show. Looks like fun all the time. They seem to be healthy, rich, popular, happy. But it's an illusion. On the inside, they suffer from guilty feelings. They have no lasting peace, no joy, no satisfaction. On the other hand, those who do good will be blessed with glory, honor, and immortality. Wow. They have a real unshakable hope in God's reward. In these verses, the phrase first for the Jew, then for the Gentile are repeated. It means in the same way God dealt with the Jews, he deals with the Gentiles. In other words, God does not show favoritism to any group. I think the Jews were very upset about this. Thirdly, God judges according to the law. The law is the standard of God's judgment. In verses 12 through 15, Paul uses the word law 11 times. Generally, he means the law of Moses. But he also shows that Gentiles have a law for themselves. Verse 12 says, All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. His point is that God judges sin, whether people know the law, have the written law, or not. Whether you have the law or don't have the law, God judges sin. Those who know the law think they're righteous because they hear the law. But Paul says, hearing is not enough to be righteous in God's sight. One must obey the law. Obey the law. Has anyone here obeyed the law fully and faithfully? If you have, raise your hand. I really want to get to know you. No one can obey the law fully. James 2.10 says this, Forever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. There are 613 commandments in the Old Testament. If a person kept 612 commandments yet broke just one before they died, they would be a lawbreaker. It's, it's not just being a lawbreaker. They're under curse and judged. So Paul says, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Someone may say, well, Gentiles do not have the law. So how can God judge them? Paul tells us that even though they do not have the written law, they do by nature things required by the law. This means they know in their hearts the requirements of the law. What evidence is there of this? Each person has a conscience. When they commit sin, their conscience testifies against them, and they feel guilt. They constantly struggle inside 
to justify themselves. This is well illustrated by the Russian novelist Dostoevsky in Crime and Punishment. A very poor ex-student, Rodion Raskelnikov, experiences mental anguish and moral dilemmas as he plans to kill an unscrupulous pawnbroker for her money. He justifies the murder on the basis he will use the money to do many good things. But after killing her, he suffers the torture of a guilty conscience until he confesses his crime and goes to prison. When we commit sins, our hearts become like a court of law with this constant conversation going on inside. It's our conscience. This is why we have no excuse. God is right when he judges, whether it's by the written law or by the conscience in the human heart. God is right. Lastly, God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ. What does he judge? It's so quiet in here. Verse 16 says, this will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. The Bible tells us that God will judge the whole world. Jesus said this, the Father judges no one but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. On the day of judgment, Jesus will be the judge. People sin secretly, thinking, ha ha, no one sees me. However, on that day, everything will be revealed. All the secrets will be made known. And Jesus will judge people's secret things. On that day, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There is no exception, nothing remains hidden, and every person will be judged by God. Jesus warned us repeatedly, those judged guilty will be thrown into hell, into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. There will be eternal agony in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And no one can avoid this judgment. But there is good news. There is good news. Jesus said in John 5, 24, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. When we believe in Jesus, we're exempt from the dreadful judgment and Jesus rescues us from the coming wrath. This is the gospel, the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. God's righteous judgment is certain and unavoidable. But this is not what he desires to do. Ezekiel 18.23 says, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their wicked ways and live? God 
our Savior, wants everyone to turn to Jesus and be saved. Let's not insist on our own righteousness, but accept God's judgment and the wonderful grace that Jesus gives. And let's not judge others, but show grace and mercy to others as Jesus does to us. Let's pray. Father, the truth of your righteous judgment is so sobering to us. But you are also so patient and so kind. Help us to know that we have no righteousness of our own. And there is no escape and no hiding place. But that in your love and in your mercy, you welcome us through Jesus, who took all the judgment in our places. Please help us to live by this grace and not judge others, but share grace with others. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.